when God made you, he knit you together in your mother's womb, or when God made the archetypal man and woman and formed the man out of the, out of the dirt, out of the ground, he made you a body and a spirit. He made you body and spirit. I'm not here to debate bipartite or tripartite. That's not what I'm trying to do here. But I'm recognizing that there is a physicality to it and a, 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 a thing that is difficult to describe, right? A transcendent nature to us, a spiritual nature to us. You are spirit and body. And if we try to separate those two things, what do we get when we take the body from a spirit? We get a a ghost. When you, do it, when you set, take a spirit uh, from a body, you get a, in popular culture, it's called a zombie. All right? Yeah, we're going there. Ghosts and zombies. Ghosts and zombies. But you get these ghoulish things that are part of our culture that we have to describe because we know that it does violence to humanity if we separate spirits and bodies. I mean, very practically, getting off of the science fiction realms, uh, if you separate a spirit from a body, you get a dead person and you are homicidal. So don't do that, right? Don't do it. Don't try to separate spirit and bodies. They, God put them together. God put them together to not be separated. Maybe the world doesn't use the word spirit. Maybe it would use personhood. You know, so if we, if we uh, maybe have not done violence towards somebody, but have degraded them in some way, then we've done violence to their personhood, perhaps is what our culture might say. And that's an important thing that our culture is grasping at, that the Bible has words for, like spirit, like person, like human. And God made you spirit and body. And often in Christian culture, the body is seen as something bad, but when we read our Bible and read it rightly, we see that the body is something good that God gave us. And when we go to heaven, we don't get rid of our body. There's not some sort of purely spiritual existence that's waiting for us. We're always, always, always going to be spirit and body together. Amen. Jesus was spirit and body. When he resurrected, he, was, he said, touch this. Does spirit, not, does spirit have flesh and bone, right? He wanted them to see his scars he wanted them to touch his body. He ate fish in front of his disciples to prove the point. I'm not some sort of ghost. I'm also not a zombie. He was proving it to them. He was showing it to them. Bodies are not bad. Bodies are not lesser. Bodies are not evil. God designed your body to know God, to grow with other people, to discover purpose, and move your body through this world to make a difference. Christians love prayer. I love prayer. I'm spending more time in prayer than ever before. But as Pastor Shino said a couple of, of weeks ago, if you don't obey on the back of the pray, then you've missed the whole point. Right. Got to pray, and then you have to move your body in the manner that God has commanded you to move it and go do the things that he's asked you to do. Amen. Body and spirit. If we tear them asunder, we do harm to ourselves and to the world. We create ghosts and zombies. But we're also going to see the real pain that we can inflict on ourselves and on others if we don't use our body the way that God has made us to use the body. So we're doing a four-week series on our bodies and how God has designed our bodies to be a temple for him. He made your body to be a dwelling place for him. I love this old song. Because, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. God loves our bodies. He wants to be a part of your body. He wants your body to be filled not just with your spirit, but with his spirit. The flesh is not only always bad. The flesh just needs redemption, sanctification, purification, just like our spirit does. And God wants to do that, and he has done that through his body and through his spirit, Amen. through the person of Jesus and through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Yes. God loves our bodies. Meanwhile, we love to numb our bodies. 
We love to use substances to ignore our bodies. We love to hack our bodies and treat our bodies like some sort of tool. We kind of either ignore our bodies or we worship our bodies. Or we worship other people's bodies. And more on that next week at the PM service. But God loves your body because it's a body and because he made your body to be home for his Holy Spirit. So let's work today to see how we might be tearing our bodies apart from their sp our spirit, treating our bodies and spirits as though they're two different things and not one and the same thing. Learn to serve God with all of who we are, including our sexuality. And so this series is going, it's got a lot to do with sex. And I said it last week, I'll say it again, no matter your sexual orientation, no matter your background, the call to follow Jesus is a call to holiness. Yeah. Not a call to heterosexuality. We follow Jesus and we are all made holy by him. Amen. And so I don't want anybody at the front end of this saying, well, this is not for me. Or maybe you feel like I've already fouled out. Listen, we've all fouled out. <laughs> Jesus, I remember that when Jesus found this woman running from her accusers. They said, this woman is committing adultery. And he bent down and he wrote some stuff in the sand and I wish it was there and I would have told you. I would have told you. And John didn't tell us, but I, I would have told you what Jesus wrote. <laughs> but he wrote some stuff in the sand. That's an important point. What he wrote, we don't know. And then he stood up and said, all right, tell you what. He who, without, who, he who is without sin, you throw the first stone. And I see in this moment, stones hitting the ground and the dust being kicked up on our feet. There's no stones in this place. There's no self-righteousness in this place. There's no accusations in this place. Just the pursuit of a holy God and the hope that we might be holy as he is holy. And God's gonna call us all to follow him. So can we do that? All right, today we're looking at what I'm, the title of my message is Holistic Sex, Holistic Sex. I feel very, holi like this could be a, a, a product in the shelves of Whole Foods. <laughs> so we're looking at Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Corinth, Corinth is a city in Greece. There was some weird sex stuff happening. Somebody was getting it on with their stepmom. So Paul's like, all right, I'm going to have to include this in my letter. And in this passage that we're looking at, I think it's about eight verses, Paul says the word body eight times. So it's all about our bodies. So let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 through 20. I believe it will be on our screen. Let's, let's read this together. Can we do this as a church body? Can we read this passage together? If you'd like, let's stand together and read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at the whole passage today that we're, we're going to look at yet, uh, last week, this week, next week. All right. And all things are lawful for me. For we are all for the 
Glorify God in your body. Thank you. Amen. In the heart of this passage, Paul presents an argument. And it's an argument that I'd like to walk through step by step, and it has to do with the body and with the spirit. And it comes from verse 14 through 17, and he says this, And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is written, the two bodies shall be one flesh, and God, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one in spirit with him. I would like to walk through this passage almost line by line and start to understand the argument that Paul is presenting here. And it all has to do with the spiritual power of sex. There's a spiritual power in this thing that we do with our bodies. And Paul is saying you cannot separate what you do with your body and what you do with your spirit. They are one and the same. It starts with this. And God raised the Lord, and he'll also raise us up by his power. God raised the Lord, and he raises us. What's this whole passage about again? Let's talk back. What's this whole passage about? It mentions it eight times. Bodies. Bodies. Was Jesus raised spiritually or bodily? Both. Trick question. Somebody got it. You're sharp, you're sharp, you're sharp. Jesus was raised, because you can't do one without the other, right? We celebrate Jesus' bodily resurrection because we don't think he was metaphorically raised from the dead or just spiritually raised from the dead. We say bodily as Christians as a point of theology because it's so uh, uh, important. But the truth be told, he was raised spiritually and bodily. He was animated and physical. Do we hope in a spiritual or a bodily resurrection? Both, yes. And so the same thing that happened to Jesus is what we're hoping for to happen to us. A bodily, a spiritual, a literal resurrection. God raised the Lord, and he's going to raise us up by his power. Next line. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? I want us to look specifically at this bodies and members. What does it mean to be a member in this context? It means to be a body part of Christ. You're a body part of Christ. You're like a hand, a finger, a digit, a toenail. I don't know. You're something. You're an eyeball or an ear. And Paul expands on this metaphor elsewhere in this book, right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he expands on this idea of being part of the body of Christ. To be a member of Christ means that you're part of the body of Christ, but specifically what is a member of Christ? It's one of those words again. It's the the body. Your body is a member of Christ. So this is not some analogy not analogous to it's like we're members. Your body is now part of Christ. And he is animating us and moving through us and using us to accomplish his purposes. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Our bodies are a body parts of Christ's body. I'm going to say body a lot because Paul said body a lot. (laughs) Next line. Shall I then take members, remember, body parts of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? That's the next line. Members. So the same union, the same access, the same intimacy, the same connection that we're supposed to have with Christ can be had with a prostitute. Members of a prostitute, members of Christ. This is interesting. What's Paul saying? The membership is the same. The same intimacy, the same access, the same connection, Same union. And then Paul says with a prostitute. And this is where we love to say, well, that's those people. And maybe you've been seeing prostitutes or not. That's not the point. Paul is saying, even in loveless, even in financial exchanges, even when your heart's not in it, these physical connections make us members with other people. 
And so Paul is not saying, oh, the dirty, dirty prostitute. That's not what Paul is doing. He's not beating up on that person. He's saying when there's even loveless sexual encounters, membership happens. The same union, the same access, the same intimacy, the same connection that we share with Christ, we can, if we're not careful, share with sexual partners. That made it sound like I'm saying, if you use a condom, that you'll be fine. That's not what I'm saying. Just for clarity. All right. Uh, He who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her, but he who is joined with the Lord becomes one with the Lord. So you can, to be joined in this case means literally to be glued together. That's what the Greek word there is, is to be joined, glued, affixed, attached. So can my body go anywhere that my spirit doesn't go? The answer is obviously no. To separate the two would be to kill me. And so the union that we share with Christ, though it's spiritual, it's also bodily. And the union that we share with a sexual partner, though it's bodily, it's also spiritual. They're one and the same thing. It's the same joined that can happen with either of these. We can be joined through sexual immorality or we can be joined with the Lord, but we cannot be both. These are the words of Paul. I know this is a heavy message and we're gonna get out of this part in a minute, but I think it's important that we see what is being said in our Bibles. This is not me and Pastor Nathan. This is me going, holy cow. I think I need to say this out loud. Some people have asked, why Why would we do this? Well, this is not the only passage that says these things. It's in the teachings of Jesus. It's in the teachings of Paul. It's in the teachings of the Old Testament. It's all throughout our Bibles. And if we don't learn what to do with our bodies, then I am being a poor pastor. And I will stand before God, and I'll have to not just answer for what I did with my body, but what we did with our bodies. And so I'm scared of God. Because he's holy. So that's why I'm going to talk about this, and that's why I'm going to break down what the Bible just says. Because if we don't know what the Bible says, that at some point becomes my fault. And that also at some point becomes your fault. And so if I don't demonstrate how to read Scripture and how to break it down and I don't show what it says about our bodies and our sexualities, then I, that's on me. All right. He who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her. For it is written, the two shall become one flesh, and he who is joined to the Lord becomes one, but he who is joined with the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Sex creates more than just physical union. It creates whole person oneness. And so physical union and spiritual union are entirely equated here. So when we take the passage from top to bottom, what Paul is saying is that the same spiritual connections that we have with Jesus that will resurrect our bodies is created even in casual sexual encounters that will destroy our spirits. The same spiritual connections that we have with Jesus that we hope to resurrect our bodies is created by even casual sexual encounters that will destroy our spirits. We want to separate as a culture, our personhood, and our bodies. We want to not equate these things, but Paul is saying they cannot be separated, and we know intuitively that we can't separate them. We're doing violence to ourselves, and we're degrading humanity when we, say, watch pornography, when we view sexual things as objects and not as people, or when we participate in hookup culture, asking for people's heart or my heart to not be connected to my body, my spirit to not be connected with my body, my personhood to not be connected with my body, for us to treat these things as though they were two separate things, they are one. So what do we do? We honor God with our bodies. Separating the physical from the emotional, the intimate from the faithful, the consensual from the covenantal is damaging to our bodies and to our spirit, to our body, spirit, personhood. And God has no part of it. So if sex is so powerful, 
sex unites, if our desire is to have sex, generally speaking, <laughs> why? Why did God put this powerful connector tool, if I could call it that, it's so much more than a tool, but forgive me for my limited language. Why did God give us sexuality? I want us to look at the purpose of sex. And the first thing that comes to mind is covenantal marriage. And I, can't, I cannot begin to unpack all of the purpose that God has for sex. There are tomes written on this by, by very thoughtful people, and I'm just scratching the surface here, but I feel a responsibility to bring this to us. Covenantal marriage. God gave us this, to, this, this powerful sexuality for covenantal marriage. Mark chapter 10, Jesus says this, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And I love ending uh, weddings with that line. What God has joined together, let no man separate. Let no woman separate. That would stand for even those that are entering into that covenant. It's covenantal. Covenantal means that a man, a woman, and God are all tied in, united in together in this promise. That promise is made public because it's not just between that man and the woman. It's actually a community that is building in and around that couple. In our culture, sex has become individualized and privatized. It's my body, my choices, my sexuality, my decisions. But that is not the way that God has designed it. Sexual union between husbands and wives was to grow a family. That powerful sexual bond was to unite husbands and, and wives, to then grow a family, to have a community around them that would trust them, so you could trust the men and the women within the community, and then around that have a society built all upon that powerful sexual bond between a husband and a wife. It's the way that God has given us this was to grow families, to grow communities, and to grow societies. Sex is an expression of commitment. It's not a hope for commitment. Sex is supposed to flow out of emotional, legal, family, financial, and covenantal commitment. It's supposed to create intimacy, but the world is demanding that intimacy comes before trust and commitment. The world demands that intimacy comes before trust and commitment because otherwise, how would we know? How would we know what they're like sexually? I don't have a you know, good answer for that, but the next thing is, that normally comes in that argument is, is this. Oh, you know, you gotta try before you buy. So people are like cars now? So we're going to really express the degradation that we sense and feel towards our potential partner by saying, well, they're basically a, a utilitarian car that I need to make sure fulfills my deep inner desires. Can we see how, and, and I don't mean to, if you've ever said that, I don't want to add guilt or shame here, but what I'm saying is that that's the argument that's in culture. Uh, men, women are not cars. Amen. Women, men are not cars. Amen. Wow, that one got a bigger amen. I, <laughs> feeling objectified, Pastor Shino. We're not cars. You're not just bodies. You're spirits. Bodies and spirits. And God put those things together and gave a sexual desire to predicate society upon my sexuality is not private. Obviously, I'm married. Obviously, that happens in private. But here's the thing. When a pastor breaks that union, everybody knows. Everybody picks up shrapnel, and I'm dead tired of it. And God, may my life and the inner parts of my life stand the of time. May my prayer life, 
my time with Pastor Shino and Pastor Cobbs and other, other friends and the retreats that I go on and the prayers that I go on always be to, to strengthen me as a man of God. Because sexuality predicates uh, 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 covenantal, uh, covenantal communion and sexuality all go together that then allows community to build around that in trust, in unity. And I want to be one of those that goes all the way. That the vow that I made to my wife, until death do us part or the Lord's return, and I added that Lord's return so that maybe we could get out of dying together. <laughs> but that's the truth of the matter. Until death or the, until we are parted by death or the Lord's return, we're together. And may I keep up my end of the bargain, right? When you die, you've, you've done it. You've fulfilled it. I have a brother that died, and got, he, uh, his wife got remarried, and there were members of my family that were really mad about that. And I was like, hey, listen, man, he's the only guy, and she's the only woman in our family that have fulfilled their marriage vows. Like, she did it. She crossed the line, and so she's free, right? Other people have gotten divorced. Other people have not, you know, not died yet. And the Lord hasn't returned yet. So our vows still stand, but theirs, they're good. They did it. Check. Done. Till they're parted by death at the Lord's return, God bless you. All right. I'm off my notes. <laughs> Gotta add some levity. And <laughs> All right. I understand that there's a deep fear of commitment in our culture. I'm a child of a divorced home. Many of us are children of divorced homes. And it's for us to go to Jesus and ask him to make us whole and to forgive our parents or our former pastors, to forgive the men and women in our lives that have broken it, to forgive even our culture and society for breaking down people into body parts and bodies, to forgive ourselves for participating in pornographic culture to find healing, to pursue Jesus, to offer our desires on the altar and say, God, here are all of my desires. Wash them, renew them, sanctify them. For some of us, those desires will begin to shift and change. God, I want what you want, not what I want. Have all of me. Have me as I am married or have me as I am single have me, God, and do with me how you want your will, not my will. Amen. Same prayer that Jesus prayed in the garden. It feels like death, friends, it will bring life. It will bring life. Why did God give us sexuality that's the purpose of this union? It's first and foremost for covenantal marriage, and that brings about sanctification. Sanctification is the process of being a saint, being more and more like Jesus. Ephesians 5, and 25, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I'm, I don't know who's got the raw end of the deal. Here's what I know. Wives, love, submit. Run with your husbands. Husbands, love, submit, die to your will. Be like Jesus. Serve your wives. Amen. Run with your wives. It feels like death. It's what being a saint feels like. It's what being a saint feels like. And after a while, there's going to be joy in that death. I promise you. Well, actually, I don't. I take that back. For some of us, it's just going to feel like death. Oh, God, help us. Give us strength, God. You know, right now, some of us are going, man, I'm so glad I'm single. That's great. <laughs> We're going to talk just to singles, or primarily why God gave us singleness and why it's a gift on the fourth and final week. It's a gift. It's not a bad thing. And my hope is that in this church, we're going to celebrate celibacy and singleness the way that a lot of cultures celebrate marriage. Yes. You're not second-class citizens here. Right. Not second-class citizens here. Thank you, Jesus. God gave us marriage. God gave us sexuality for sanctification. 
when we view our potential partners through the view of sanctification rather than satisfaction, things begin to shift. The world says, seek the partner that will satisfy you. Jesus says, seek the partner that will sanctify you. Those look like two different people. Those look like two different people. When I was dating my wife, she hates it when I talk about anything about her. She's like, Nathan, nobody wants to think about me being here. And she's like, can I please disappear? But when we were dating, <laughs> she would make fun of the woman of my dreams because I was, I was honest. I was like, you're not what I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, that came out. I'm a horrible person to date. Well, I'm a really good person to be married to, I think. I was like, this, this is, you're, you're, you're different. You're different than I was expecting. And she would go, yeah, I'm not that, that American woman of your dreams, am I? She's like, she's not as good as me. <laughs> she's not, she's not. God gave me the woman that I needed, not the woman that I wanted. And I believe that there are women and men that you need to go on the journey that God is calling you to, and they may not be exactly what you want because the woman that I wanted would have made my bed <laughs> and, and cleaned her room and been good at paperwork. And Elsa is none of those things. <laughs> But do you see how the woman of my dreams would have let me stay a child instead of growing me up to be a man? All right. Sanctification. Are we looking for somebody to serve my goals or are we looking for someone to serve? Are you looking for someone to serve your goals or are you looking for someone to serve? One's about your satisfaction, one's about your sanctification. Amen. Finally, procreation. God blessed them, said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Whole person, body, spirit, union was, to desi was designed to bring new body, spirit people into the world. And that's the context that God wanted new babies being born in. So, Lord, we're a long way off of your design. Married, unmarried, single, gay, straight, just all of us are off of the design of God. Jesus said, if you've even looked, Matthew 5, 28, if you looked at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery. And I don't think that was so much gender or sexuality, men and women, it's just people, if you're, if you're daydreaming about this, if you're looking at people, if you're separating a person's body from their personhood, from their spirit, you're committing adultery. You're adulterating the situation. You're breaking the design of God in that moment. And in these moments, we realize, oh gosh, I'm a long way off, God, of what you've designed. And I believe that Jesus came to rebuild sexual wholeness. Rebuild sexual wholeness. Jesus ministered to people who were caught in adultery. Jesus ministered to people who thought that their sexuality was right, and so they would throw stones at other people who weren't participating in that. The Christian church has gotten really good at that too. Again, may the stones hit the floor and kick up the dust onto our feet. God, forgive us for throwing stones. Forgive us for thinking that we're the righteous ones. Oh, goodness. May we find new community and new family at the foot of the cross and not on our soapboxes. Connect groups, connect group leaders. As we go into our connect groups this week, may we find brotherhood and sisterhood at the foot of the cross, not on our soapboxes. We need grace, we need reconstruction, we need healing, we need wholeness. There's a number of ways that we might, in this moment, be off of the path of God. 
Jesus, I know this, you came to seek and save the lost. You came healing bodies, restoring sight, helping a woman bent over to stand upright. He came expressing outwardly what was happening inwardly. And maybe none of us look like we're beat up physically because of our sexuality, but I know the damage and the toll that it can play on the inside of us. My hope here is that there's no shame, that there's no, uh, yeah, just wanting to get out of here because, you know, that was awkward. <laughs> but that we together could find wholeness in, in, with, with Jesus. We could be rebuilt, restored, renewed. We love to say my sin is okay and their sin is not okay. We all need to trek towards Jesus. Everyone, everyone is moving towards Jesus together. At the end of the service, we're gonna have prayer ministers up at the, up at the front. My encouragement is to use them. <laughs> I think every one of us could have a moment where we go, we confess sin. Or we leave behind our shame. Or we admit to our pain. Man, the pain of parents divorcing. The pain of being divorced. Of having to be a single dad or a single mom. The pain of having a partner cheat on you or you cheating on a partner the reality that maybe though you're in love or though you're engaged, that's not God's best, that's not God's space for covenantal sexual union. My encouragement to those who are engaged, the, those who are in love, who are those who are on a marriage path, is practice covenantal union while you're dating by not having sex. Practice it. Demonstrate to your future husband or to your future wife, I'm faithful covenantally. Jesus died to take away our sin. It takes and requires the blood of Jesus. Marriages don't take away sin. Keeping it to yourself doesn't take away sin. Burying it super deep in your soul doesn't take away sin. But Jesus died to take away our sin. Some of us are battling statistically something like 70% of men and 40% of women are battling sexual addiction and pornography. Maybe not even battling it. I've seen that it's more socially acceptable to watch porn than to not recycle among younger generations. This is not a beat up on the younger generations, not at all. But we're constantly trying to justify ourselves instead of letting Jesus justify us. He died to save you. He died to heal you. He died to make you whole. Some of us have been abused. The sex has been used as a weapon against you. Jesus died to remove every feeling of pain, of inadequacy, of unrighteousness from you, and may it never be seen again. We carry things that we had nothing to do with, and that's just not fair. Through Jesus, through forgiveness, we can get these things off of us. So wherever you are, this is the message that we've heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all of our sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we walk, sorry, but if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he's faithful, he's just, he's going to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word's not in us.
Jesus, we come to your cross this morning. Lord, knowing that your design is holy, your desire for us is pure, that you're not here to beat us down, you're here to set us free. So God, I pray that today you'd be here, that we would walk in the light, that we'd experience a new level of freedom, a new level of healing, a new level of wholeness, God. May shame have no grip on this church body. May shame have no grip from the back row to the front row from the worship team to the connect group leaders. Lord, may we walk in the light as you are in the light. Have fellowship with you, God. Have fellowship with one another. God, I pray for strength to run through our veins and, and in our bones and in our bodies, God. The, the, uh, the deep desires of our heart would win out against the strong desires of our body. That God, in this place we could create and walk in, celebrate, a countercultural community, a people that celebrate celibacy, a people that celebrate holiness, a people that celebrate marriages and children, people that celebrate when we die to ourselves, we pick up our cross and we follow you, Jesus, with our bodies, with our sexuality, with our thoughts, with the private parts of our life. Lord, we give you our all. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. In Jesus' name, amen.